The views and opinions expressed during this show do not necessarily reflect like the, the policy, policy or position of any affiliated workplace or employer. The views and opinions of the show do not constitute recommendations for therapy. Please, Please contact, contact a licensed SLP for individual consult on your situation. Please listen carefully. What is communication? An essential behavior of life. We have the both blessing and responsibility of trying to foster another. It's transmitting a thought from one person to another. It's the strongest way for two people to convey information to each other. The back and forth between two people. Communication is a lifeline. Just connection with other people. Connecting people in terms of ideas or thoughts or needs. Draws us out of ourselves, draws us into that relationship, you know, builds up our families. Without it, we'd be lost. Whatever it is that we do to express intent and achieve an impact. Communication is the ability to express your needs, wants, frustrations, and desires to anyone that you feel needs to have that information. Welcome to Speech Science, episode number 142. I'm Matt Hodd, an SLP in the schools and also working in home health care with adults for dementia and stroke rehab, joined by Mike McLeod, an executive functioning expert in Philadelphia and private practice owner. What's up, buddy? And our third person, Michelle Wintering, our school-based SLP, or I'm sorry, our, our young intervention-based SLP. Uh, she is out this week, so it is just the two of us, Mike. Yeah, just you and me re representing the the uh, the two percent. Ooh, I love it. I thought we were at three and a half percent. Are we only back mm -hmm. down to two? Mm, probably two. Probably. We want to hear from you. Head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. And from there, you can email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com or give us a phone call, 614-681-1798. You can also check us out on the Discord, discord.speechsciencepodcast.com. We got a full show for you all today. We've got our SS Pod shoutouts and SS Pod due process. We got two doozies there. We also got the informed SLP. Uh, check it in. And I also had the chance to sit down and interview the hosts of the Cup of Council podcast, Amy, Katie, and Brittany, a brand new speech science, or sorry, a brand new speech therapy podcast hitting the airwaves. And Mike and I today, we are going to deep dive into executive functioning. And hopefully Mike teaches me about why my brain doesn't always like to work. But of course, we want to hear from okay. you. So make sure you send that information and you can also use the hashtag ss pot so michelle's not here mike so it's just you and me yep. let's start off like we always do tell me tell us something that has been good to you this week uh good to me this week that's a good question well one of my good friends from uh undergraduate college before i ever knew what speech therapy even was uh came and came to visit this weekend so that was really nice got got to get out and play some golf Ooh, got, nice. got, a little, got a little sunburned there we go <laughs> so uh but but yeah it was nice uh it was nice to get out nice to enjoy the weather nice to get away from uh speech pathology for a while uh but yeah you know looking to uh expand our office space in the in the in the therapy clinic you know trying to take advantage of these uh commercial real estate prices now because of covid uh so yeah definitely uh you know some some exciting things for the summer looking to do some more of a summer program nice uh with with some of our kids with like sports and trips and things like that so uh trying to think outside the box a little bit now do you uh hire other slps or are you flying solo out there uh there's some slps that like work with me you know uh you know, based on what they want to do sort of thing. Gotcha. Uh, so, so yeah, there's, there's other members of the uh, grown out team. Nice. Very nice. And then will you have to, when you say you're looking to expand and maybe you don't want to say it right now, but will that mean you have to change buildings or will you create a satellite office or are you literally talking, expand the stuff you've got right now? So same building. Cool. Uh, it's actually going back to the office we were originally in, but not sharing it with as many people oh. uh so it's same so right now we're in one building on the third floor we would move down to the second floor oh that's pretty cool yep. mm -hmm. it's all a part of owning a private practice dude yes sir there's a there's a lot involved a lot of uh really annoying negotiation with these com commercial <laughs> real estate people which i wouldn't wish upon anybody because these people suck uh fair but uh but yeah it's uh it's it's definitely it's part of the process 
Uh, for me, uh, I continued to lay down another 30 bags of mulch around my house. So okay. I think I am now at up to 65 bags of mulch laid out. 64 bags of mulch have been laid out. Okay. And I've got another 16 or so bags left. Wow. Dude, okay. So maybe it's because our job is so... How do I put this? We don't see very many tangible like improvement immediate we see a lot of improvement over time mm-hmm. but like week in and week out with our jobs as therapists we don't see like very rarely do we see a kid walk in or an adult walk in and they walk out and they're significantly different you know what i mean uh-huh. it's it's over time i love doing goofy manual labor in my yard because like laying out 31 bags of mulch i now see the immediate difference of laying mm. out 31 bags of mulch um they're both rewarding, but there is something about that immediate gratification of, of seeing change. I'm glad you mentioned immediate gratification because a lot of that has to do with executive functioning, which we, Ooh, which we will be uh, so a beautiful segue. I am teasing. We'll get there. We'll get there. Hold off. Hold off. Mm-hmm. However, before we get to that, we have our SS pod shout out. It's the opportunity to do something awesome or to recognize somebody doing something awesome in communication or disabilities. Uh, you can always email that in speech science podcast at gmail.com or uh, on any of the social medias hashtag SS uh, pod. Sh- I'm sorry, SS pod shout out. I almost called it the due process this week. The shout out comes from Kyle who sends us an article from Florida Gulf coast university. Uh, John Sioka uh, won the Thomas Edison award for creating the you belong voice, which is a new, uh, advanced text-to-speech synthesis and alt AAC powered by Microsoft. Nice. So it says that he wanted to do well or do good in the world and went out and created a brand new AAC app. I like it. And you know what, dude, that's what we need. We need more innovators in our field. Agreed. Yeah, we really do. Uh, You know, anytime we can get some people with, uh, you know, obviously you get into this field to be uh, most people come in to be, you know, direct treatment Obviously, that's that's the, the the highest percentage. But you know, anyone who can get into research, anyone who can you know devote their time in this field uh, to doing to doing things like I said before, outside the box. We need researchers. We need our tech people. Mm-hmm. Uh, we need our people that you know. Uh, it, it's very easy to go to work and just do treatment all day and evaluations all day. But uh, you know, the more innovation we have, the uh, the more we can work smarter, not harder. You know. This is coming from the director of the Daveler and Kiwani School of Entrepreneurship, who oversees uh, John uh, Siako. Uh, they say he's a junior in college, and this is his second Edison Award. John's goal is to make a social impact, to make a difference to so many people. He's motivated and determined to create products, become financially successful, and make the world a better place all in one. See, there you go. Entrepreneurs mm-hmm. in our area. So that'd okay. be pretty cool. I'd like to reach out to him. Maybe he'll come on air. If yeah, let's you do it. know somebody that deserves an SS Pod shout out, hit us up. We would love to talk about it on the air. However, on the flip side, it's the SS Pod due process. It's where you can give us a question and we can discuss it on air and then maybe continue it over at discord.speechsciencepodcast.com. This week, Mike comes from Beth and she poses the question Would you guys take a job that pays half the salary? but comes with half the caseload. That's a good one. I would in a heartbeat. Half the salary, half the caseload. Yeah, well, half the caseload, half workload. Uh, Dude, there is so much to be said about not burning out. Yes. My, yes. Have you done anything besides private practice or have you been pre- predominantly private practice your whole career? Uh, I've, I've, I've done it. I've done it all. I've been have in you- the schools. I've done EI. Uh, yeah, I, I've been, I've done everything except for adults. What was your caseload like? If you remember or want to talk about that when you were in the schools? Uh, it was pretty intense. It was definitely intense. Uh, everything was, it was a charter school. So Ooh, it, it was okay. an app. So a lot of it was an absolute mess. Sure. In terms of uh, who I was seeing, what the goals were, I was working out of a out of a closet. Uh, it was it, it was it was a rough situation. It, it, it was not uh, not ideal. Yeah, that sounds kind of 
That it sounds kind of rough. It was one of those schools <laughs> that had to uh, had to get had to contract with an agency in order to get a speech therapist. They couldn't get a direct hire, yeah. and that's how uh, that's how I got stuck there. Um, I will say this: I didn't realize how much I was doing at my old jobs until I went to a job that was basically half the caseload that I had, and yeah. I realized that I didn't have to be the superhero therapist. You know, we all want to try to be the best therapist that we can be. Uh huh. But I feel like when the whole, it feels like the whole department is weighing in on you or relying on you, we mm -hmm. have a tendency to overdo. We're now the, AA, now we cannot, now we're the infallible AAC guru, the infallible childhood dysphagia, the infallible voice person. In a caseload of 90, it catches up to you. So in a heartbeat. It definitely I, does. In a heartbeat, Beth, I would go half the caseload for half the income. But then again, I'm sure there's a ton of SLPs out there that would say, no, I mm -hmm. need the money to back up all that I've done, especially, my, student especially my student loans. <laughs> and they'll say, you know what? I'll I'll take the big caseload, but Hey, you're not gonna you're not gonna take away my finan my financials and and hey, more power to them. It, for since moving to that different model, mm -hmm. the 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 costs would have to be, the, I'm sorry, the salary would have to be double what I make now to take on double the workload. In a perfect world, <laughs> in a perfect world, you would keep your salary where it's at or increase it, of course. Right. And they would hire a second therapist to decrease the caseload. Exactly. Yes. But yeah. Which that's needs our, which needs to happen. Dude, very rarely do our SS pod due processes are pretty much a unanimous decision. That was an app. Yeah, that was <laughs> that was that was completely spot on. There, there oh. needs to be multiple SLPs at every single school in america mm -hmm. period what i don't understand though and maybe i do understand this i mean to get there to get to that point where we can have multiple slps we have to all take a stand and not take the low-paying jobs well tell that to the cfys i know tell that to the to the grads but yeah that's exactly what it is or the, the retirees the, these people are going to be offering Thirty thousand, forty thousand, fifty thousand dollar a year jobs to SLPs because there's people out there that take it. Mm -hmm. And why hire a seasoned SLP who's going to keep increasing in salary and is going to have massive, you know, possibly a pension, all these things? Uh, if I can get a cheap new person, uh, I was and, just sorry. Yeah, it's not just in speech therapy realm. I was talking to one of our other related service po folks. And they were saying that they heard of a, or they work with somebody who had four years of acute care, mm -hmm. but they got hired because they could come in at step zero versus the person that had seven years of experience in the schools. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. So whatever, that person's probably trying their best, but it, it hurts the kids. It hurts the families. It hurts the whole department realistically. Agreed. I, yeah, it's a uh, it's it, it's a broken system in, in more ways than one. Uh, and, you know, this is a, this is a country where a lot of school funding is tied to property taxes. Uh, mm -hmm. Money is not spent wisely in schools. Uh, teacher salaries have not really increased over the past 20 years. Uh, so there definitely needs uh, something needs to be done. And uh, our, our, our current president is someone who uh, kind of that, that was one of his big selling points was, hey, you're going to love this presidency if you're a teacher. So hopefully he uh, he backs that up. Well, I'm waiting, Joe. Yep. Yep. Still here. Side note, happy uh, teacher appreciation week to all of our teachers. That's true. Last week was uh, related service week. So our friend Rachel uh, put up a funny video today. Did you watch that? Our friend no. Rachel, uh, the PT. PTSD SLP. Rachel Rashamba. Yes, yeah, she, she put, put up? up a she put up a funny video of a uh, all year all year teachers say I'm a speech language pathologist. I'm not oh, a speech yeah. teacher. <laughs> and then teacher appreciation week comes by and they go, "Hey, I'm a teacher. Recognize me. I'm a teacher." <laughs> hey man, I'm a, that that is side note. I always get hung up on those Facebook conversations where they're like, "I'm an SLP. Call me an SLP." And I'm 100% with that. But mm -hmm. you know what? If Chipotle is going to give me a free burrito for having my teacher's card, hell yeah, I'm getting my free burrito. 
Hell I'll yeah. argue semantics later. <laughs> Hell yeah. You're teaching speech, man. You're teaching speech. Oh, if you got an SS pod due process, something you want us to discuss, email at speech science podcast at gmail.com. Our big topic of the night, Mike, executive functioning. So uh, for the folks that are just tuning in, because uh, I'm sure we've got a few folks coming in just to listen to the Cup of Council people. So welcome. Hopefully you enjoy the show and stay and subscribe, rate us five stars. That'd be great. But Mike, you run a executive functioning clinic out of Philadelphia. Is that correct? Uh, it's of? a it's a it's a speech language oh, pathology yeah. clinic. I, I'm a speech. I'm an SLP who specializes in. ADHD and executive functioning. So, so I think my uh, EF isn't working if I couldn't put that in a straight sense. Okay. I, res- <laughs> I respect it. What does an SLP do who focuses or specializes in ADHD and executive functioning? So before we even dive into what is EF, what is it that you do? That is an excellent starter question. Great job. Uh, and and it's really, like you I know, did this for five years. You know, the, the number one thing that, you know, some people have started to refer to me as, uh, and because of the work I've been doing, is the ADHD SLP. So the Ooh, ADHD like SLP, it. that's sort of like the, the rebranding. And because a lot of what I talk about is really trying to empower the SLP community. Because what we now know about ADHD and executive functioning, I truly 100% believe that the, the SLP should be the leader, not a member, the leader on the treatment team of kids with ADHD. And people are still so like, oh, wow, really? It's still so shocked when I say that. They're taken aback when I say that, all these things. The more you learn, the more you know. And executive functioning is based in language. First of all, a lot of people don't even realize that ADHD is executive functioning. So ADHD is not some separate thing. ADHD is executive dysfunction. So what do you mean when you say that, that it's executive dysfunction? So ADHD, what we now know about ADHD, ADHD is a developmental delay of the executive function system. It is a developmental delay of the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is the home of executive functioning. So ADHD is a developmental delay. It's not some standalone thing. It's not something with kids who can't focus or kids are hyperactivity. It is a uh, it is a delay, typically a three to five year delay, depending on severity of executive functioning. Hmm. So then, how does the so? then you were saying that the SLP should be one of the leads or if not the lead when fun- when attacking EF or ADHD. Correct. Correct. What would we start looking at? Okay. So, uh, so, so that's a, that's, that's a loaded question, of course. <laughs> uh, but you know, this is, this is basically how I describe it where in the past we looked at ADHD and we didn't yet know about its connection to executive functioning. Right. In the past, we looked at ADHD based on the external symptoms. We looked at kids that were hyperactive, couldn't sit still, and kids who were inattentive and couldn't focus. There's two types of ADHD. There's ADHD, hyperactivity, and ADD, inattentive. So we just did that. And we would change the environment. We would put in all that you, you know, sometimes it it would be ABA, sometimes it would be CBT, psychology, whatever it may be to to decrease their external symptoms. But now with all of the MRI study, the brain studies, the CT, uh, the CT studies, we know that uh, it is the frontal lobe of the brain that is developing slower. There are legitimate brain differences in ADHD and serotonin, vasopressin, uh, uh, the, the dopamine are released at lower rates and it's harder for them to regulate and motivate and things like that. So in the past, we looked at hyperactivity and inattentiveness, but now we really know that it's internal skills that they are lacking that are tied to executive functioning. It's not hyperactivity and inattentiveness, it's the ability to self-regulate, the ability to self-motivate towards non-preferred tasks the ability to self-evaluate and learn from past experiences. And the most important thing to remember, especially when it comes to SLPs, 
is executive dysfunction is a dysfunction of internal language. So that phrase of internal language is what I'm constantly pushing out there with my social medias and grown out therapy and everything. So what is internal language? Internal language is two brain things, brain, <laughs> brain, whatever. Brain things. Got brain it. things <laughs> working together in harmony. Number one, Lopes, non, number one, Yep. Number one is nonverbal working memory, mm -hmm. which is the visual imagery system of the brain, the ability to hold an image in mind, manipulate it, plan, pri prioritize, problem solve, re-image the relevant past, learn from past experiences, forecast yourself into the future and self-motivate, uh, create mental movies, have high definition mental movies in your brain, uh, be able to use all of your external senses internally. So with nonverbal working memory, you can see to yourself, you can smell to yourself, you can taste to yourself, you can hear to yourself. It's by far the number one foundation of all executive functioning is nonverbal working memory. And that's the visual imagery system of the brain. And it's basically the mind's eye. Uh, and then there's a verbal working memory, which is the self-talk system, which is really that ability to use your brain coach and have those internal conversations. And, and just like I'm talking to you with my mouth, I can talk to myself internally using the exact same system of the brain to have a conversation with my brain, the brain coach, and talk to my brain and have an internal system of checks and balances. So try that. that, that and, and, this, and this is the thing. So the, the speech and language system that we train as speech and language therapists is what I'm using right now, correct? Mm -hmm. I'm using my language, I'm using my speech, I'm using my vocabulary, I'm using my MLU, and I'm using my <laughs> articulation and those things. I'm using that right now, correct? Correct. Okay. But executive functioning is the ability to talk to your brain, correct? I well, you, so. ca you, cannot, you cannot talk to someone else and talk to your brain and have an internal voice at the same time it is the, and why not because it's the same system it's the same exact part of the brain are you talking about in in typical or in adhd or both in typical you oh, and i okay. right now you and i you cannot have an external conversation and talk to your brain and have an internal dialogue happening at the exact same time you can't do it because it's the same exact thing so what speech therapists are training is what you need it just has to be internal language so my question because I'm an idiot and I need these, these in simple forms, Mike, mm -hmm. is that why, like, if I am working with a student and they start, and we would call it drifting off or I used to drift off in class, is that like my internal language is going off on its own thing and my, I can't function on the world around me? Well, there, that could, well, that could be many things. There's probably something, you know, they're probably just not self-regulating oh, okay. uh, number. So number one, they're probably not self-regulating They're you know, you're probably boring them. Uh, and uh, they're, they're thinking about, <laughs> they're, they're thinking about Roblox or Minecraft or whatever. And they're, they're self-motivating, they're self-regulating, they're doing whatever. But the reason they're not talking to you then and they're ignoring you is because they're talking to their brain or they're having some sort of internal uh, very immature internal language based on a preferred task. Internal uh, language gotcha. is useless. Internal language is useless unless you're able to use it to be productive. If you can, if, if I'm sitting here using my internal language thinking about Fortnite, it's not going to get me anywhere. So when I have to, this is true. This is 100% true. I have to create ABC lists for myself. And I'm mm -hmm. going to show you on my screen if that'll like focus out. I legit have like it broken down between SLP stuff, home stuff, bowling stuff, coaching stuff, podcast stuff from my son, personal to do list, parenting ideas, all of that. And then in each of those, I have ABC list. Am I, is that my internal language that I'm just writing down so I don't have to have an internal language? So that's you creating an external system of, of organization. For that's my you, internal language. That's you modifying your, you know, it's 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 sparking those things. Oh, yes, okay. I got you. You know, it's it's basically it, really what it's doing is, you know, executive functioning starts with nonverbal working memory. So you're creating verbal checklists that if you are someone with strong executive functioning, you'll read that verbal checklist when you're supposed to to remind yourself, and it will spark a mental movie in your head. 
So, so if you see, so if you see an ABC list and you're reading it, mm-hmm. and while you know, you know how like when you read a book, you have to imagine it in your head to understand oh, it. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. Th- That's that's exactly what you're doing. Oh, I got you. Yeah. So if I have to set an alarm to remind myself to look at my notes, <laughs> my tone. Am I telling you I've got a weak EF? Like no, legit. No, no. Okay. That's you utilizing your that. That's you utilizing technology. That's 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 a very that's a that's a great thing. Also, you have a bunch of kids. Yeah, and things and and thing and things to distract you. So that's no. That's that's actually strong executive functioning. Um, that's you gotcha. planning ahead. It's kids with weak executive functioning that won't even think to set an alarm. So how do we know the difference then? So uh, we, we, we've always called executive functioning. And when I work with my adult patients, I, I've stolen your idea before where you've talked about it as the uh, guy air traffic the controller. Air traffic controller. Uh, I still use my gallon of milk and cups of different sizes and uh, all these different things. We could call it like the little guy up there running the show. But how do we know when someone has weak or underdeveloped executive functioning versus true sensory needs or behavior or language deficit? Or are they all kind of intertwined? Uh, Many times they are intertwined. Uh, You really, you know, a lot of this comes from observations. Mm -hmm. So in order to diagnose executive dysfunction, the vast majority of tests are checklists. You have the brief, the behavior rating of uh, inventory of executive functioning. You have the McCloskey scales. You have the self-behavior rating, all of these things. Uh, So you have to do observations. You have to look at writing samples. You have to observe them in various uh, settings. And when you're noticing these chronic issues, as well as parents are reporting this, teachers are reporting this, you can see this kid is not quite acting their age. So one of the best ways to uh, explain executive dysfunction is okay this person's uh 10 years old but they're really developmentally seven and you know they have the self-regulation skills of a seven-year-old so anytime you have that three to four to five delay from actual age to executive age then you know okay this is a problem this person has exact has a developmental delay of executive functioning they're really behind in their independent skills. So kids with ADHD and executive dysfunction uh, have great difficulty being reliant on prompts. So these kids are incredibly prompt dependent, which is why you see 30 to 40 page 504 plans or massive (laughs) IEPs with crazy SDIs because these kids need unbelievable prompts. They can't submit work on time. They can't use an agenda. They can't figure out Google Classroom. They need extended time. They need to uh, be able to take tests in a separate room. They need to be able to chew gum during tests, whatever it may be, just to accommodate them externally. Uh, so, so really, uh, overall, um, it's really just about you know what this individual is presenting with. How do you know what is age appropriate? Uh, so, it, <laughs> that, that's, sorry. Yeah, that's uh, it, it. It depends on on what we're talking about. Okay. Are we talk? Are we talking about socially? We talk about academically. We talk about behaviorally. Uh, there's you know there's there's a lot of research out there that really describes what you know. Just like when a baby's growing and acquiring language and acquiring their milestones, you know, there's social and behavioral and academic milestones for each grade. Uh, and you know, you can really see what are the other kids doing, and what is this kid not doing. Uh, so it's not really milestones, but you can you can you know you can see when a kid is alienating themselves, mm-hmm. separating themselves. Is there a massive massive list of missing and late assignments? Are they do, do they do they seem to constantly know the answer and they're on top of things yet they can't perform, they can't execute? Uh, it, it, the, these kids stand out uh, more often than not. They do stand out. Every once in a while, you will, you will get the get the one kid who's diagnosed late. Uh, because, you know, they kind of pushed through on their intelligence. And that's another thing to, to remember is that a lot of kids with ADHD have above average IQs. So these kids are incredibly smart, incredibly creative. They can get through, uh, but it's just the, the execution. It's the reliance on prompts. So a lot of kids don't even realize they have ADHD until they hit college and things fall apart. I was going to say, is that why like a lot of ADHD kids like just fall apart somewhere in like, seventh through 14th grade or 12th grade and then height in college because 
they can handle, they can learn on their own. They don't really care what the teacher's doing. And then all of a sudden we see that yeah. shift and they just don't have it. And they, they can't learn on their own anymore. The, the, the content is getting too complex and that's exactly what it is. So many of these kids have a very, very weak nonverbal working memory, which is the foundation of executive functioning. And they have a weak verbal working memory. They can't really manipulate language. They just try to memorize, memorize, memorize. And eventually by seventh, eighth, ninth grade, the content gets too complex and they can't just memorize it and regurgitate it back onto a test. So how do you work? Do you work on working memory or is it more the compensatory mm -hmm. strategies for memory? You got to, you got to work on working memory. That's that, 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 that's everything. Like having them recall seven, like legit. Is it like having them recall? No, seven not, digits, so, not stuff like that. Like, uh, like, like functional, like very, very functional things. Uh, so it's not really, you know, I'm not going to work on something that they're not going to have to use, you know, whether, uh, whether you're working with them on, uh, whether you show them a picture and have them have them describe it to you, uh, whether we do actual practices of creating mental movies of things they have to do, then they have to act it out and gesture it out, uh, whether they have to create a story and describe it to you or you're showing them a clip and they have to describe it to you, uh, whether, uh, you know, there's there's so many practices of, you know, a lot of it is reflexive questioning. Reflexive mm, questioning okay. is, is, is crucial uh, for executive function therapy in terms of having kids create an image in their mind, a movie in their mind, and ask lots of questions so they can give you details on it. And every single time I'll be on my second session with a kid and they'll create a mental movie and their, and their description of their mental movie is so bare bones and so ridiculous. And it's like, this is not going to help anybody. And then you do the therapy, do the therapy. And the mental movies become HD and like they're like, it's almost like a real movie in their head. So that's what, it, that's what it's all about is getting the movies to go from, pic, from pixelated to HD. Now, do you feel like executive functioning impacts pragmatic language? Cause like, as you're it, it, talking, yeah. I'm hearing that you're describing some of the kids that I have worked with over the years that we diagnosed as, or labeled as pragmatic language deficits. Yep but they were so, never really pragmatic kids. They always just were off. So here is another. So I, I like to talk about the ADHD language connection okay. and all the, like, I, I like to highlight it because, you know, a lot of people, like I said before, they, they hear, oh, a speech therapist specializing in NEF, like, how could that be? So I highlight all the reasons why speech and ADHD are related. And one of them, one of the biggest ones is social pragmatic disorders being founded in executive functioning. So the biggest thing is when you have limited nonverbal, limited verbal working memory, how does that present itself externally in social situations? So kids with ADHD and executive dysfunction have great difficulty with something called situational awareness mm -hmm. and, the, and the ability to read the room, they call it, read the room or read the field. So when they're brought into a cafeteria, they're brought to a library, they're brought to recess, they don't know how to step back, observe the room, talk to their brain and say, oh, he's over there doing that. She's over there doing this. How can I act a certain way to make myself match these people? How can I make my body look like their body? How can I make my behavior look like their behavior? How can I match this room? Just like when you and I walk into a cafeteria, what do we do? We sit with our friends and we socialize. We walk into a library, we know to be quiet. These kids don't know how to do those things. They don't know how to uh, conform to the situation. They, don't, they have a lack of situational awareness. Uh, there's also a, uh, there's also a great lack of social reciprocity with ADHD. So that involves a lot of perspective taking. So social reciprocity and perspective taking are huge in ADHD because that requires you to think about others thinking. But when it comes down to it, you're not even thinking about your own thinking. You don't hmm. people with ADHD have very low metacognition. Metacognition is an executive skill, self-evaluation. So per, for perspective taking, you have to think about others thinking, think about their interests, uh, think about ways to, to build the relationship and, and, be, and be socially related to these people. Uh, and that's very, very difficult for these kids. And, that's, and it's due to the lack of that internal language. 
So now you got me questioning everything I do in therapy. Thank you. That's the point, bro. Uh, (laughs) But no, I mean, in a good way, like part of what you're describing, I'm thinking of some of those, like I said, some of my pragmatic kids and, and what you're describing is what or similar to what we're working on. Just, I haven't called it EF training for, for EF language. My, my next immediate question for you, and I don't want to jump ahead, but if we're looking at, and a goal, like in schools, we're very goal based. We have to have something that is measurable and shows progress over time. What would be like one of the first things that you target? Hey, good. Excellent question. Yes. So that is Almost another, like I did this for years. That is another thing that people always say, we got to have a measurable goal. We right. got to have this, we got to have that. How do so, I measure so, how long so, it takes them to answer a question? So like I said before, one of the beauties of executive functioning therapy is that we don't have to do these BS, 80, <laughs> 80% accuracy, 90% accuracy, this percent accuracy. Executive functioning is all about independent skills and making the kid less prompt dependent. So every single one of the executive function goals I write for my student are uh, will, will do blah, 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 blah with fading prompts towards independence. So the goal is reached when the student is no longer prompt dependent. And of course, that has to be age appropriate. If you're working on executive functioning with a fourth grader, fourth graders are naturally prompt dependent, yes. But it has to be, you know, an appropriate goal for that age. Uh, But that's how you do that. So how is that measured? That is measured by the number of prompts given by the adult or the teacher. It is that this goal is not reached until the teacher reports it, the parent reports it, however it's labeled. This student has now done this independently five times in a row without prompts. So this student has now gained this skill independently. So you could almost, so again, I'm bringing it back to school, so I do apologize. You could almost write the goal as in saying student will decrease from Mm -hmm. nine prompts to five prompts within one IEP year. Could do that. Blah, yeah. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Task you know, depend, depending on the age, you would you would want that to be, you would want the goal to be written so that it's zero prompts. Got to be obtainable, dude. Yeah. Well, the, you make it attain, you make it obtainable by the age. Uh, I so see you, you see what I'm saying? So, like, you know, if, if it's if it's a young kid and you want them to, uh, you know, uh, be able to sit at circle time, whatever, you know, that you uh, find, you find different way, you know, you find the right, you find the right way to word the goal so that it's no longer, so that there's no prompts needed. You don't want to have like one or two prompts. You want so, that, you want it to be truly independent. So a preschooler independently sitting at circle time for five minutes. Yeah, there you go. But a middle school kid completing a yes. 10 question worksheet. Yes, within, we'll have we'll have 15 minutes with zero. We'll have zero late assignments in the course of mm. a month or something. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, I something. About, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> well, you get my point. <laughs> it, it, everything has to be tailored to the individual because ADHD is a spectrum disorder, so it's different for every single person. So now you got me questioning. If we're if we're all actually working on executive functioning and we don't know it, or we're not measuring the right idea. Yeah, you are working on, (laughs) you are working on executive functioning because language is executive functioning. Look at, look at the initial language milestones that babies do when they, when they first grow up in terms of maintaining focus on the person's face, making eye contact, uh, object permanence, being able to hold something in mind. It's all executive function skills. Every all the pre-verbal milestones are executive function skills. Period. Period. They're linguistic and executive functions. Eye contact, everything, like movement, all all of those things. So lang- So in, in college, we learn about expressive language, receptive language, social pragmatic language, written language, reading language. It's going to get to the point where internal language is going to be right there at the collegiate level. Internal language. How do we teach internal language? What is it? And that's what's missing. And the more that, like we mentioned it before, 
the more that this generation continue to, continues to grow up in an instant gratification world of high-speed internet, next day delivery, Google, all of these things, there's going to be an issue with executive functioning and internal language because things, everything is instant now. Internal language takes time because uh, one of the first executive functions to develop is inhibition, the ability to stop and think, the ability to stop and call on your nonverbal working memory. That's basically all executive functioning. Inhibition, nonverbal. Inhibition, nonverbal. But now kids don't have to stop because everything is instant. So the more that this is, it, this skyrockets and ADHD <laughs> uh, diagnosis rates are skyrocketing, uh, we're going to learn more how it's all based in language. So theoretically, we should be... How do I put this? I almost want to say that we should be chucking out almost everything that we do in school-based SLPs and shift our focus. Well, there's a lot that we do at school as school-based SLPs that is kind of useless in terms of executive functioning. Like for example, WH questions, being able to answer WH questions. It really depends on the context you're working on that on, mm -hmm. but working on WH questions is kind of a waste and kids are just memorizing it and spitting it out. I don't disagree with that at all. Okay. I mean, like yeah. I, the WH questions I work on is for students that answer, how do I put this? They answer concretely on what they see. So if you ask, if you show them an ice cream cone and you say, where would you get an ice cream cone? They might answer ice cream cone. And I'm like, oh, let's listen to that. Where, where like is a place? So where would you go for, that's the WH questions I'm working on. But I've inherited goals though, where they're like, we'll identify the secondary and tertiary uh, characters from a novel. And I'm like, what in the uh -uh. hell is uh -uh. this? This uh -uh. is stupid. I, I was on an IEP call the other day <laughs> uh, about a student that's having a lot of difficulty with reading comprehension. He's like two grades below on reading comprehension. And the teacher comes on or whoever it was, the reading specialist goes on and on and on about how they've been teaching him uh, onomatopoeia and all these different things right. that are just completely useless. Right. When it is so obvious, this kid is diagnosed with ADHD, he's simply just not making a movie of what he reads. So for example, you showed an ice cream cone and said, where would you get this? He saw a picture of an ice cream cone and that triggered his nonverbal working memory to say ice cream cone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he his nonverbal working memory, I, I like to refer to it, is still in the Google images phase where it's just a picture, it's just a picture sitting there. Strong executive functioning would see that picture, hear your question, and then re-image the relevant past of a time when they got an ice cream cone because they went to an ice cream parlor or an ice cream shop. So it's all about what's happening, what images are in your head, what movies are in your head. And it's so hard for people to understand this because people with strong executive functioning who have strong mental movies, strong nonverbal working memory, strong self-talk, we've done this our entire lives without even thinking about it. We talk to ourselves, we make movies to ourselves, we are constantly doing it every second of every day subconsciously, and it's just natural to us. But it's simply kids with ADHD don't do it at all. Do you think it's hard? Because because my next thought is, how do you get a transition? How do you change the mentality in the schools from going, we're teaching WH questions, we're teaching reading comprehension, to we're we're strengthening executive functioning? And my immediate my immediate question, or I don't even know where I'm going with this, Mike, other than teaching EF feels like it would look a lot different than teaching vocabulary strategies. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like with vocab strategies, there's a book, we're doing a reading, we're reading a newspaper, but then in EF, I feel like we might be open discussing for 35 minutes. With EF, it's it's really you know it's it, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion, but it's it's a lot of reflexive questioning. It's very rapport based, you know. It's really just you know it's not so much about vocabulary, you know. It's more about the connection you have to the language, to the environment, to the stimulus. So, for example, like you can show a kid a picture of you know a man, 
then you can show up a picture of a man with a horse and then it's a horse the man's on the horse and then the horse is running and then the horse is jumping that you know they see the picture it triggers it, it triggers their internal internal uh, language and then they're able to expand that sentence overall and they're connecting with it because they're visualizing it you know the the problem with a lot of kids in vocabulary is the words get a little too complex and they can't make a mental image of what that word stands for. Uh, that is what helps kids memorize uh, vocabulary when they're when they're, there's an internal connection to it. Uh, you know, that's that's never going to go away. That's always going to be part of the human psyche. Uh, so it's really just uh, helping them to connect with their words, connect with their language and have visual representations. And I can see how a teacher or an IEP team would jump on the idea based on what you just said about solely looking at phrase expansion mm -hmm. or vocabulary expansion. Huh. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's, there's still a lot of work to be done because the vast majority of schools hear executive functioning and think OT or school mm -hmm. psych or mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And, you know, I, I've completed some really good research in the field and hoping to get that published as fast as I can. It's a massive pain in the ass. Right. But the, the, <laughs> this, this language connection to ADHD is, is huge. And I have absolute faith that the research is going to continue to show. And if you watch any of Dr. Russell Barkley's presentations, he talks all about the internal speech system, the internal language system. His, his famous quote that I love the most is he's talking about the period of language acquisition is the same as the period of executive function acquisition. It's the same thing. And he says, there comes a point in brain development when what you say starts to control what you do. What you say starts to control what you do. So what you say to yourself controls what you do externally what you say internally controls what you do externally and that's adhd so if you say to yourself i need to go clean my room i need to go study i need to go do oh. chores i need to do this you're going to be able to do those things because you're using your internal language it's kids that act like they have no control over themselves and are super impulsive and are super hyperactive those are the kids with adhd because they don't say anything to themselves and we teach them to write it down so then they can read it. But that's the problem. Got it. That's verbal. Mm -hmm. That's verbal. It needs to be a picture. It cannot be verbal. Oh, Ver I see what you're saying. Verbal checklists do not work. I just made a cool TikTok about that recently. You really, you're on TikTok yeah. now, Mike. Yeah, dude. Check it out, man. It's on, it's on uh, Instagram. Executive functioning TikTok. Yep. Okay. So my last question, because I feel like we could dive into this more, and I would love to, to do another one of these where we dive more. What is the link between executive functioning and I guess dopamine and then ADHD and dopamine? So people with ADHD have brain differences, mm -hmm. legitimate brain differences. That, so they're, they are not neurotypical. Uh, and um, dopamine is released at much slower rates. So dopa, it's harder for them to self-regulate and self-motivate. And 90, I, I, I basically want to say 99.9, .9, but I'm sure that number is greatly exaggerated. <laughs> I just feel like it is based on my caseload is these kids get sucked into technology big time. So yes, teens these days are obsessed with gaming and phones, but it's the ADHD executive dysfunction kids that get really sucked into gaming and really sucked into phones and they can't help themselves because they are getting constant dopamine drips from video games, phones, YouTube, whatever it may be. And then as soon as they're done, after they've watched or played for four hours, everything else sucks and life is miserable and they're irritable for the rest of the day and nothing else gives them that drip like the gaming does because that's just instant gratification over and over and over when they're in complete control. Uh, so, so that's one of the biggest problems that I deal with there is working with families to help them create some screen time structure. Is that like not the same? And I'm not saying ADHD kids are, or ADHD folks are like addicts, but is that the same idea with why addicts get hooked on shopping or alcohol or drugs or casinos? 
gambling, I guess is the word. I, I, I compare, I compare gaming with teenagers to gambling. So that's like the number one thing is we have so many regulations on gambling. You can't gamble to a certain age. You can only do it in certain States at certain places, but that's really the, that's really why, because if it were everywhere and it were rampant, people wouldn't be able to control themselves because it's so addicting and they would ruin their lives. But so teenagers, teenagers every day are ignoring their work, ignoring their friends, ignoring their parents and playing Fortnite for six, seven hours unregulated and it's destroying their lives. So when we think a kid is, a, and, and I know this is taking a, a weird turn now, or maybe not, but like when we say a kid is perseverating on something and we're like, oh, the parent comes in and says, oh, they never stop talking about Roblox or uh, Fortnite or whatever. Is that just more of that ADHD or not ADHD, but executive functioning and looking for that dopamine hit? So there's many things at play there. You know, okay. you, number one is you can have uh, one kid who is just so completely sucked into the game and their parents have no screen time structure. And as soon as they get home until they go to bed, they're just playing Roblox for hours and hours and hours to the point where it consumes their life and it consumes their thoughts and it c consumes their entire non verbal working memory. They literally can't talk about, it, about anything else. Okay. And then on the other side of things, with ADHD also comes the perspective taking issues. Mm. So if you're talking about Roblox nonstop, you're not picking up on the cues that you're annoying people and no one wants to hear about this. So there's many, many factors to play there. So perspective taking and executive functioning go hand in hand and that's where we can see that internal language and perspective taking. Perspective taking is basically metacognition about someone else, thinking about someone else's thinking. And it's like theory of mind. You can't do that unless you're able to do it for yourself first. You can't, you can't do it internally. You're not seeing to yourself. You're not talking to yourself. How can you possibly understand someone else's thoughts if you don't understand your own? I am sure we're going to have a ton of questions after this week, Mike. I hope so, man. Send them, Ooh, send them that out. That was fun. I'm glad we dove into that this week. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, if, if you guys are, if, if the community out there is listening, uh, shoot me a DM on Instagram at Therapy. Shoot me a DM or, or DM us at, at speech underscore science. Uh, either one, just DM us, ask your questions. Uh, I love chat. People chat. People text me every day from growing out therapy. Hey, I'm an SLP. Here, here's my student. What do I like? What do I do? Or, you know, help me, you know, be, be able to do these things. But I'm telling you, my number one goal is for new grads to leave grad school and to know what internal language is. It is a legitimate thing. It is just as legit as expressive and receptive. We need to start treating internal language skills. I think you've now given me something to research for the next three months of uh, the school year. There you have it, bro. Thanks, Mike. Hit us up, speechsciencepodcast.com. Email speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Or like Mike said on Instagram, speech underscore science, or yours is Grow Now Therapy. Grow Now Therapy, now, right? Yeah, grownowtherapy.com is my website. And then uh, Grow Now Therapy is my Instagram. See, Mike, we've always said that you're the EF expert. We were just putting you to the fire today to make sure you were. I hope I, I, hope I lived up to the hey, task. So question, you know that test that you passed out on Facebook and it said that I had terrible whatever it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Why? What was that all about? Why would I have terrible working memory and all of that fun stuff? Well... In, 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 in all Thanks honesty, me, Mike. In, in all honesty, in all honesty, I think it was because you took that test after you had COVID. Uh, well, I still have COVID fog, man. Not going to so lie. Then, that's what I'm saying. So if you took that test pre-COVID, would you have scored higher? I hope. That's I would I say so. Through, I got through grad school pre-COVID. I so that's that's what I'm saying. So you know, the, the like like our friend Rachel, who also has long COVID, uh, would say, you know, this 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 COVID stuff is real, man. It's it's a it it affects your brain. So I so I I would assume that COVID affected that area for you. Dude, you would be proud of me. I sat down today and did four hours of Medicaid billing. It is the longest all since COVID that I've been able to sit down and do one pro one task. And how long ago did you have COVID? Uh, December. So five so months ago, four and a half long, months ago. So there you have it. That's completely insane. And in those four hours, I had to take 
only two breaks, three breaks. Goodness, dude. So I was proud of myself. Like I had been putting off the Medicaid billing and I sat down and did five months of Medicaid billing. That is very impressive. <laughs> Speedsciencepodcast.com. On the flip side of the break, we're going to check in with the informed SLP. Mike and I will come back with the ASHA spotlight. But uh, I'm excited because there is a new podcast in town. It is the Cup of Council podcast with Amy, Katie, and Brittany. Uh, they're coming up right here on Speed Science. And now for our regular research review, brought to you by the Informed SLP. The Informed SLP releases a monthly newsletter that brings you plain language reviews of only the newest, most clinically applicable research, keeping you up to date on advances in the field and saving you tons of time. So let's get to it. Adhere, adhere to your dysphagia diet. Shifting focus from medical risk to patient well-being. This is a review of the article Balancing Eating with Breathing, Community Dwelling Older Adults' Experiences of Dysphagia and Texture Modified Diets, published in The Gerontologist. You've educated, trained, and supported your patient, but the discharge date is fast approaching. Will they follow your diet recommendations at home? We know that dysphagia is more than just swallowing to nursing home residents, but what about those that discharge to the community? Diet adherence for community dwelling adults with dysphagia is even more nuanced. In this study, authors interviewed 20 adults with dysphagia who discharged to the community to figure out how they navigated life with a texture modified diet and how living with dysphagia impacted their social and emotional well being. An adherence continuum was revealed. On one end, individuals accepted their diets and followed recommendations. And on the opposite end, participants exercised their right to compromise, reject, and cheat during mealtime. The participant interviews showed wide-ranging perspectives. Patients felt they had to choose between eating and breathing. Patients hid their dysphagia symptoms during public events to preserve their identity. Adhering to a texture-modified diet made some participants feel like their lives were falling apart. And it was no easy decision to adhere or not, compelling some participants to opt for the middle ground, balancing medical concerns with social losses. We know that texture-modified diet adherence is complex and personal, so we've identified tips for a clinically proactive approach. Set aside sufficient therapy time to discuss the complexities of individual barriers to adherence, like embarrassment and fear, before community discharge. Welcome family members into the conversation. Create an action plan for mealtime and social events that includes key people in your patient's life. Demonstrate texture modification techniques and complete meal preparation observations. Focus on harm reduction. Support your patient's choices by helping them understand different levels of risk, even if that departs from your diet recommendations. By considering social, professional, psychological, and personal needs before discharge, you can empower patients to maximize the benefits of their texture-modified diets. Thanks for listening to this review. If you're interested in more, come visit us at www.theinformedslp.com. Tell us how you put the research into practice or find us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at The Informed SLP. Welcome back to Speech Science. I'm Matt Hot. I'm excited because every time we get a new speech therapy podcast into the world, into the ether of speech therapy podcast land, that means there's more listeners and more information going out. And today I'm excited because we are talking to Cup of Council podcast with Amy Gunlock. No, Gun. Yeah, Gunlock, right? Yes, you mm-hmm. did it. <laughs> I thought I was going to mess that up. Brittany Schultz mm-hmm. and Katie Joyner Robinson. Yes. 
So welcome to Speech Science. Welcome to the realm of speech therapy podcasting. You guys are on episode eight or nine, did I see? I think think seven. Seven just got posted, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first, before we go into who you guys are, why did you all decide that, yep, I'm going to jump into the crazy world of podcasting. I'm going to put myself (laughs) on front street. I am going to uh, be yelled at by random people for talking too much or not enough. What made y'all want to jump into podcasting? You want to take the floor? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Amy, you, Amy, you take this one. Yeah. My mom told us to do it. Really? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It's it's really the answer. Wait, really the answer. Wait, what, what, what do you mean? Your mom was just like, Hey, Amy, you know, what would be really cool. I don't have enough podcasts to listen to. So I want to hear my daughter talk on air. I mean, you hear that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she texted me in the middle of the work day, like call me, you know? And I was like, Oh God, it's one of those situations. And I called her, I was in the, you know, I had finished a session and I called her and she was like, I was just thinking the three of you should do a podcast. You talk all the time. Anyway, you're funny. You have funny stories. You talk about speech stuff and parenting things and your friend, you've maintained this friendship long distance for over 10 years and it's unique. And I think you should just do a podcast. And I was like, okay, mom. Okay. (laughs) And then during one of our, you know, weekly three-way video calls that we do together, we were talking and I threw it out there and then Brittany was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we kind of like forced join her along with us. So I just get dr- drug along. So I want to, Brittany, I want to ask you like, uh-huh. obviously, okay. So they said you jumped right in. What was your thought? You're like, yeah, this sounds great. Or was it like, ah, oh, maybe I'll agree to it and it won't happen. What was that? That process? Oh no, I was really excited. I right away was like, oh, I think this could be good because I think we're pretty funny. And you know what really? <laughs> so I think my first thought was I really wanted to tell people about all of our trips <laughs> Even though we are, we, you know, we're speech, speech podcast, but also mom stuff and friendship stuff. And, um, I think some of our trips have been hilarious. And so that was my first thought was we have a lot of like funny things and the long distance friendship thing, I, I think is significant. We have never lived in the same place besides the year and a half at graduate school. So I was really excited. And then why do they call you joiner? So Joyner is my maiden name and that it was just, I was called that in high school. And then ironically, when I got to graduate school, we had multiple Katie's. And so I was known as Joyner. They've always called me Joyner. It's really odd to hear them say Katie. It would be like the most bizarre thing. So mm-hmm. I've been called Joyner all along. So that's why we can't physically say Katie. I think one of our episodes, Amy's like, we can't do it. It's too awkward. It's like you. It's the weirdest thing. It'd be like if they called me something that's completely not even a part of my name is how odd it would feel. See, I coach high school kids and I got yelled at by a parent who, when I would call everyone by last name and they're like, why are you calling everyone by the last name? I was like, cause I have three mats plus that's my name. And we are done calling people by their first name for a while. All right. So you said y'all went to the same grad school. Where did y'all go to grad school? We went to Truman state university in Northeast Missouri. Okay. All right. And then mm-hmm. where are y'all from before that? And then when I say y'all, that's my Ohio hillbilly coming out. So I do apologize. <laughs> so I, Amy, I'm from Minnesota and I live in the Brainerd Lakes area. So okay. it's kind of a touristy resort kind of an area. Um, are you still up there now? Yes, I okay. am. That's not where I'm originally from in Minnesota, but that's where my husband and I live. Very cool. And I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. And is that where you're at now, Brittany? That is. Yeah. Awesome. And I am a proud Ohioan, and I currently live outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, I.O. Awesome. We're so oh okay. No, now like what Amy, was that? Amy, what Brittany, was that crap? Amy, Brittany, you guys are fine. You can do whatever you want. So <laughs> where did you go to undergrad in Ohio? Well, I actually went to undergrad in Kentucky. I went to the uh, University yep, of Kentucky. We're done. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody stayed in Ohio. And I was like, I'm going to go far away. And then I was like, just over the border. So I went (laughs) to Kentucky and then I was going to go to graduate school in Kentucky. And then I, after a long random story, I ended up in Northeast farm town, Missouri. So that's where I went to graduate school. (laughs) I honestly did not. uh, When I looked at grad schools, I never looked outside of Ohio. So I give you guys all props because it sounds like none of y'all are from Missouri. So that's cool that you guys all ended up there. Now, what setting do y'all work in? 
So I currently, this is Amy. I work <laughs> in, uh, we've been told that our voices sound similar. So people can't tell us apart on our <laughs> podcast. My mom actually asked for us to identify ourselves each time oh, we no. speak. And I was like, oh, no. mom, I'm sorry. That's not really how this works. <laughs> and in her, that's her own mother asking yeah, for right. that. So yeah. if that's <laughs> else, yeah. anyway, um, I, I currently do birth to three, um, home visiting and a little bit of preschool services, but I work for the school district. So our birth of three early intervention is through the school districts in Minnesota. And I've actually been virtual um, since last March. So that's been fun. Are you um, liking the virtual side? I actually love it. Do you, you really see this uh, green screen behind me? Well, that's yeah, there's her green screen. <laughs> oh, she's such a nerd. She's a real good therapy nerd. nerd. She mm-hmm. is like she is, yeah, she has sucked me down so many virtual green screen rabbit holes with her. It's been crazy. Yes. As you so, can tell by my background, I do not do green screen and uh, <laughs> I don't even care anymore. So, <laughs> okay. So, and then Brittany and Joyner, what do you all do? Um, I work at a children's hospital and mainly outpatient. We do cover inpatient, but we pretty much get everything in outpatient from, you know, all your typical kiddos that would need speech therapy all the way to, um, lots of kids who come from out of state and from far away for evaluations. I do a lot of treatment plans for outside SLPs. Um, and yeah, we, we get pretty much everything there, but I'm mainly outpatient. I do cover inpatient for uh, neuro rehab when necessary. And I used to do more inpatient, but not anymore. Okay. And then join her. And I work um, in the schools. I am one of the speech therapists for the preschool program. And I'm also the speech therapist for one of the elementary schools, kindergarten through fourth grade. Wow. Y'all do the little kid stuff. I don't like, I can't, man, I did a one tour duty in the preschool and uh, I am nine of my 10 years in middle school and high school. So I went back to my comfort zone and I also do home care with, with adults. Um, So Y'all said that you guys talk about being mom. Are all three of you moms? Yes. Awesome. Uh, without giving up too much information, if you share what you want, how old are your kids? How many? How often do you leave them alone with sharp knives? Well, that fun <laughs> stuff that we want to know. Like, <laughs> um, I have three kids. I have a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and a six-year-old. So they're all perfectly spaced. Right. Um, yeah. And she's certifiably insane at this point. Yes, hey, I take Amy, on too many projects. <laughs> d- don't let anyone tell you with three kids that you're insane because ours are seven, four, and six months old. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how many dogs do you have, Amy? You have... Oh, yeah, I have three dogs also, yeah. How many bedrooms a... do you have in your house? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> yeah. Not enough. One, they all stay together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just have one baby and he is nine almost 10 months nine and a half months he's a little one still he's a little one yep currently crying hopefully not uh, being picked up on the audio nope you're good (laughs) but he's he's with my husband he's not alone with knives don't worry anyone that (laughs) listens to the show they know that michelle's kids might be yelling mike's daughter new new baby might be yelling my two boys walk into the background so like if they hear a baby crying they're gonna assume it's one of my unruly children so you're got it okay perfect (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I have two boys. Uh, they're really close in age. Um, and currently they are four and five. Awesome. How do you guys feel? And, and, you know, we're going to jump around. So I talk as much as y'all want, interrupt me. I'm okay with it. How do you guys feel like being parents has impacted you guys as therapists? And then moving that into the podcast realm where you can talk about being not just the therapist, but you can talk about being the mom and, and y'all have kids, that are near the age of the children you work with. Mm-hmm. We actually have talked about that quite a bit, like amongst the three of us. And I think it's going to be probably a future topic, but um, personally, like when prior to being a mom, I think I would expect a whole lot out of parents when mm-hmm. I, I, and prior to doing birth of three, I was in private practice for the first about six, six years of my career. So I, you know, got to bring the kids back with me and the parents weren't there and I did my thing. And then I came out and handed them a piece of paper. You know, I didn't know at that point that I was not doing the best job I could be doing. You know, I wasn't involving the caregivers. I wasn't, I was just expecting them to just absorb the stuff I told them to do. And, um, then what what that all changed when I realized like, I got to give them, you know, more, they need to be more involved and I need to be more specific and also don't, you know, overload them with so many things, pick like one important thing. And, 
Um, and if they come in and say, we didn't get to any of the homework, I am not going to have judgment in my mind anymore. You know, Mm -hmm. I think that's my big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My big one, mine is really fresh. Cause you know, I just went back to work in November. I've only been back a few months and I would say my biggest thing is just empathy. I think my first evaluation back, I had a family that was, um, you know, a new diagnosis of autism and they were really upset and emotional. And I felt way differently for them than I felt before. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also just for the kiddos, I feel like I was, I don't want to say I was like mean, I think we've all talked about this before, (laughs) but like really strict and harsh. And then you see them get upset and frustrated and you're like, Oh, I'm picturing my baby being upset and frustrated. Mm -hmm. So gosh, that empathy for me, I feel like I'm just a lot more easygoing, um, and just feel a lot more with those families. Cause you can really relate. My big thing too, is I see a lot of apraxia. So I would say, oh. okay, I, I need to see you four to five times a week, um, bigger sessions. And my families are amazing and they would do it. But thinking now I'm like, I free when I want doctor's appointment. So I think that's my biggest thing. That empathy. I hear you hundred percent. Like they used to give me being the only male in the grad program. They're like, oh, here's this kid that bites and we need you to not give up the, you know, the puzzle or the book until they say, I want book or I want puzzle. So I'm just sitting there hunkered down, the kid's screaming. And now the moment a kid screams, I'm like, is that my seven-year-old? Like in years, like if he was in this like MHMD unit, I'm just going to give him what he wants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Joiner, how has that affected you as like a parent and then also as a therapist? Well, I, that was my first thought actually, when um, you asked the question was also empathy. I think Mm -hmm. that's probably the biggest thing that I, I don't think it wasn't that I wasn't empathetic before I was empathetic as a person and I was empathetic as um, a therapist. And, but once I became a parent, I could be empathetic as a parent. And I think that that's a different, um, a whole different thing because you look at your, your kiddos and, and currently my kids are the kids, the exact age I work in. So it's, I look at these kiddos and I look at these families and I think her son is to her, what my son is Mm -hmm. to me, that's your baby. And I think I, I don't know if I ever gave like unrealistic expectations to parents, but I think now I go in with a much gentler approach and a much easier approach of, um, I'm, I'm with you on this and we're going to do this together. And I know that this could be scary, but, um, I'm here with you. Um, and I kind of always mention like, I'm a mom too. And I think you can still be a wonderful therapist. If you're not a parent, I think mm-hmm. you, that goes without saying, I just think, um, my heart grew even more. I think when I became a mom, well, and, and, you know, you touched on something. I think it's difficult when we look at, we send therapists out that are like 22 and 23 years old and Mm -hmm. say, okay, handle parents. We haven't really trained you on how to handle a parent that has just found out that their little baby has autism or their little boy has autism or, Mm -hmm. Hey, go work in the nursing home with the 80 year old dementia patient that hates everybody because they take away his food. Mm -hmm. And if you have Mm -hmm. no personal history background in that area, Mm -hmm. I mean, you're right. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. what made y'all want to get into therapy? What brought you down that path? Great oh, question. Boy. Well, Amy has a long. I, Amy's, yeah, Amy's got. I'll go last. Oh, no. I'll, I'll take. I'll take this. Did one your first. mom text you, Amy, and say join the therapy role? <laughs> her mom told her to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will take this one because mine's probably the easiest answer. So both my mom and my dad were speech pathologists. Oh, really? Yes. So I was raised with it since the day I entered this earth. So my dad owned his own private practice and my mom worked for the birth to three program for the county board. And my whole growing up was um, going to therapy with them. If, if I had a day off school, I went to work with my dad. He did home health and we went around the houses and I watched my dad do speech therapy and, or I went to work with my mom and watched her do parent training with families. And it was kind of just always what I wanted to do. I mean, I thought about, I went into education first and then personally, I think teachers are saints on earth, but I (laughs) was like, I don't want to sit in a classroom all day. So I want to take a kid and then I want to give them back. So I, I, it kind of in the end was like, of course, duh, of course I'm going to go into this. And so I just 
grew up around it, loved it, and just always kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. Were your parents on board then when you said, hey, this is what I want to do? I, they were. My mom, okay. unfortunately, passed away when I was 15. Oh, I'm sorry. So, which is kind of uh, kind of deep for a podcast, but it's been interesting um, now seeing myself do what my mom, what I grew up watching my mom do. That's so cool. So it is very cool. It's a connection. Even though I lost her at 15, it's been an interesting connection to have. My dad, who is still living, um, of course, yeah, he was ecstatic that I wanted to go into the same field. So, yeah. That, do, do you ever like game plan with him on a, on a student? <laughs> like, um, I wouldn't be able to. Like if my mom or dad were in this field at all, I can't even game plan on how to parent my own child with my parents. Like I couldn't <laughs> imagine being like, I have this tough AAC kid. Right. I, I think... My dad was always really good at behavior. Okay. And so I will call him. It's nice being able to call him and he knows he knows what my job's like. I feel like some people can call and talk to their parents about it and their parents don't really have any idea of what mm -hmm. it would be like. The nice thing is that when I talk to my dad about my day or a case I have, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. He's done it. He was, he's worked in the schools. He's worked in home health. He worked in a um, nursing home. And there for a while, I was working in a nursing home as well. So I would call him about a lot of feeding questions and swallowing questions. And we would just talk about it. And oh, I would cool. say we more just get to like, um, just have conversation about it. Like, you know, this kid did this, so I did this, or I saw this patient at the nursing home and they did this and, and, you know, just to get his feedback is, yeah, it is really nice. That's so cool. Yeah, it is. It's fun. So mine's a little bit opposite. I did not know speech was a thing until oh. college, until college. So it just wasn't, um, it wasn't something that was in my school and I just didn't know, didn't know about it. So, um, I went into to school with the desire and plan to do special education, I think regular education. I think I was looking into special education and I went and toured and met the head of the department and did all, you know, that new freshman stuff. And it just didn't feel right. I'm like a big, like gut feeling kind of person. And my uh -huh. gut feeling was telling me this isn't right, which is crazy. Cause I grew up with a chalkboard in my basement and I forced my little brother to be my student all the time. And I played <laughs> school all the time. My whole life, I wanted to be a teacher, but something just was telling me that I didn't want a classroom um, of special needs kiddos, but I did want to be with the special needs kiddos. Um, so I did a wonderful advisor that suggested the introduction to communication disorders, which was the soft, my sophomore year, I believe. So it was the same time that phonetics was a mm -hmm. part of the curriculum. So I took them at the same time. And I say this in one of our episodes, but I love phonetics. I love phonetics. And for the first time in my life, something clicked and I was really good at it. And it was probably one of my so best cool. classes. And it just like, it makes sense to me. Nothing else does. I'm really bad at math, never care for science. I feel like <laughs> I really struggled in school, but for whatever reason, I just, I really loved phonetics and I still, I could sit here and transcribe everything. So every intern I have, my poor interns, I'm like, you need to learn how to do. So like we're, we're doing IPA yeah. all day yeah. today. Yes. I literally have them do that quite often. So, cause it is really important, I think. And I just, like I said, it clicked and I just knew there, that gut feeling where I was like, oh, I'm in the right field. And then, you know, a couple of classes later, I realized we'd have a master's and I was like, oh, okay. Well, oops, <laughs> oops. <yeah. laughs> but best decision ever. So I constantly think about that supervisor advisor. I don't remember her name, but oh. I mean, yeah, isn't that great? Like she, totally you changed molded my life me. random person you random person are like one meeting that we had you changed my whole life so That's those so advisors cool. at colleges are really important so do you ever wonder what would have happened if you would have stayed into the special ed track I don't actually okay. um I don't I feel like I probably would have seen the speech therapist at the school I was working at and I probably would have been like mm, I'm gonna go get that degree. I bet. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have not thought about that. Cause this, like I said, the second I took phonetics class, I was like, this is it. This That's is so for cool. me. Yeah. Yeah. My phonetics uh, class was the complete opposite is where I learned um, that I talk different than everyone. I took my phonetics course uh, up in Northeast Ohio and oh. they were transcribing how everyone said the words like umbrella and Cleveland and Cincinnati. And I was like, uh, I don't say it like that. And they're like, you got to transcribe it the way someone talks. And I realized I talk different down in the South and up there, <laughs> I guess. 
That's funny. You guys also say pop, which I'm not sure what that is. So pop yeah. is a lovely drink that I used to have before when I was younger and could afford <laughs> that much sugar. So <laughs> oh, right. soda, soda. Got it. Okay. It's pop. It's pop. <laughs> it's pop. <laughs> All right. So Amy, you said you're going last. I'm worried that this is either going to be like a really like tearjerker story. Oh, or... no, it's not. Okay. Okay. Go for it then. Like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go that way. No, <laughs> it's not a tearjerker story at all. No, I got to college and I just had a whole lot of fun. And so, and I was going to be a nurse my whole life. And that's what I started out. And I, I did real bad in my freshman year of college in my nursing prerequisites. And I was going to a private college. It was costing like, I think it, the first one year of tuition was like $36,000. And that was, you know, however many years ago. So I'm sure it's way mm -hmm. more now. And it was like, well, I can't afford to try all those classes again and hope to get into the nursing program sophomore year. So I moved back home, lived with my parents, um, took all of my generals and took an intro to communications disorders class at the state college that I was trying to catch up all my generals at and loved it. And then I didn't want to live with my parents anymore. <laughs> so then I, I moved to the college that my boyfriend, who is now my husband, I moved and um, went to the college that he was at and did my undergrad there. Um, and the way I got into it was another, it was like an advisor, I believe at the second college I was at who we, I talked about, you know, I want to do nursing, but I don't think I can handle like the blood and all that kind of stuff. But I, and I also wanted to be a teacher, but I don't want to have just like the, these other two, like a class of kids or anything like that to deal with. <laughs> so she kind of led me into that intro class and yeah, that it's the same kind of thing. And I've heard it from several people. Like I wanted to be a nurse, but I wanted to be a teacher, but you know, this is like a perfect middle ground. Um, so yeah, that's how I got into it. I guess it wasn't that long. No, that wasn't bad at all. Like, see, I thought there was going to be this, like you had one career and then jumped into another. Oh no. But it was just I mean, that you were a terrible student and had too was, much fun your freshman year. I did. And then it took me three years to get into grad school. So I did not get in the first time. And I had to come up with plan B that many times. And that's how I ended up in Missouri. Cause I needed a school that had rolling admissions. Cause it was the yeah. third year in a row. I hadn't gotten in. And I went on ASHA and found any college that was within driving distance of Minnesota that had rolling admissions. And within like two months, my boyfriend and I were moving to Missouri. So, so we're all I, three. Oh, I'm sorry. That's how I ended up randomly in Kirksville, Missouri. <laughs> so we're all three of you all in the same cohort then, or whatever you all call in grad it? school. In grad school. Grad, mm -hmm. grad school. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was, okay. So I, I got, I need to, I need dirt. What was that? Like the first time y'all met each other, <laughs> did you guys expect to be friends for, did you say you guys are 10 years out? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 10 or 11. More than, more than yeah. 10. Yeah. We're like yeah. the same. I'm 35. So I don't know how old you guys are. Oh yeah. We're like, yeah. 34, 30. Yep. Yeah. 30s. I'm old. I'm 30. You know, I, I said 34. Thir Actually tomorrow I'll be 34. <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. Tomorrow Thank I'll you. be 34. Thank you. You guys can sing to me later. Thank you. So, so <laughs> did you guys know that you guys were fast friends or I mean, no. Michelle Absolutely and I went to the, not. Michelle and I went to the same grad school program and we weren't friends until midway through like the first quarter. So wh what I happened? They, they, I bet they didn't go to a bar and not invite you the first few oh, times. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. We, so our class was only 12. So oh, okay. we were the whole class a small class. class. Yeah. So we did every... to a fourth of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we were all really close. We did everything together, but the very first night we all met during the day, during the class or whatever. I think we planned to go out to this bar and I think you had already left joiner. Is that what happened? And no one had your number because we didn't know each other yet. Yeah. I, I think I came late. You guys had already like met each other and I, I was Maybe moving in from Ohio and I think I came a little bit later or something. Oh, okay. You're you still definitely on lived time. there. Yeah. We, <laughs> it's still on Eastern time. You were definitely living in Kirksville because we all sat there and we were like, oh, that one girl, we didn't get her number. The one girl and with a huge ring on her hand. So yeah. I, I came to graduate school engaged. <laughs> okay. I, I was a, an early one and it's still working out. So I must've been okay, but hey. I got engaged early. So I was engaged before I moved to Missouri. Um, and my fiance now husband, he was going up to school out there as well. So 
I, I had an engagement ring and from the get-go, apparently I, they, they thought that I was, you guys thought I was a lot older. We thought you were old. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cause your yeah. hair was really short too. You came in and you had like a cute outfit, really cute, stylish, short hair, a giant rock. And we're like, oh, she must be a mom, I guess. Like, She's like a non-traditional <laughs> student for sure. Yeah. They thought it was She's a non-traditional, one of those non-traditional She's like 50. Yeah. She yeah. looks great, but yes. she might be 50. Yes. <laughs> So, so it wasn't, yeah. I, they went out to like a bar and I wasn't invited. And then, <laughs> and then I don't know how we ended up being friends. <laughs> I don't really know. I don't really know. And we've, we've kind of tried to figure this out before because we got really close after graduate school, mm-hmm. which is funny. Yeah. Cause that's when we all parted ways. Mm-hmm. I, I don't really know. I guess there are some pictures of the three of us. Like when you two, those two did like the eval team, mm-hmm. um, for graduate yeah. school. And I, there are a couple of pictures where I would like come to the clinic and do paperwork. Like when you guys were there all the time, doing paperwork. we would be there all the time because yeah, our grad school had different teams and Amy and I got assigned to the grad or the evaluation team. So any new client that came into our clinic, we evaluated them. So Amy and I would be at the clinic so late at night, just like typing until up. 4 a.m. Cause like we're terrible procrastinators, <laughs> terrible. Yeah. We're awful procrastinators as it is, but then we'd have to sit there and type up these long evals, which as you know, when you're first learning takes forever mm-hmm. to learn how to write a proper vow. So, and nobody else had to do it. It was no one else that. did it. Just the two of us. Weird. So I think we really bonded <laughs> over that. And then I think, mm-hmm. um, we really bonded after graduate school, I would say, especially because it was, we were new speech therapists. Mm-hmm. So we would like, we actually made a group text and we would be like, Hey, I just got this. What would you do? Hey, I got this. What would you do? Hey, guess what I saw. And I think with that, and then mixed with life events, like outside mm-hmm. of speech, mm-hmm. um, we kind of all went through some trials and tribulations and we really clung to each other during those times. And so I think it just kind of made us very, very close. And that's how actually that text one day I would said, I need to, I needed advice on something. And I went, I sent them a text and said, I need to go, I need to ask my counsel, um, something. And that's how we actually became the counsel. So I think it was more after we, after grad school, but I will say during grad school, we were also really good friends because we had like themed parties. We lived in a very small (laughs) farm town. So we had themed parties like every weekend, like anything, anything but a bag party or no, anything but a cup. What am I saying? (laughs) Anything but a cup. cup. We drank, somebody drank out of a bag. I think so So you had to bring, oh, you did. Yeah. (laughs) And we had like a Lady Gaga themed party and we had, so we had these like themed parties really frequently because grad school is hard and we had to get through it. And that was Mm -hmm. something fun to do. And there was only 10 or 12 of us in that class. So it was like, we would all just be together. So that's kind of how we got close. I think life, I think life in general got made us very close after graduate school though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That's so cool. Yeah. No, uh, I didn't become friends with anybody in grad school until my fiance had to talk to everyone and be like, no, he is not trying to hit on anybody. <laughs> He's just like a lonely person. Please invite him out. Let him come to dinner with you. He will not try to date anybody. Yeah. There is a rock on my hand. Like, no, like legit. Like I remember, I, I remember it was Michelle and it was her two roommates. And I was like, can I come over and study with you guys? Like for neuro. And they were like, uh, and I was like, you can talk to my fiance. She says it's okay. <laughs> I need to pass so I can come home and have a job. And then after that, it was like, oh, he's engaged. He's fine. He's so. good. Yeah. He's safe. It's hilarious. <laughs> and see, I, I feel like I can slightly relate to that because my dad was a speech therapist. Yes. So he would always tell me how it was. He was the only male in his program. And he he did go to an Ohio, an Ohio school for grad school. Go? He went to the University of Akron. Uh <laughs> where did you go to school all right so i went to undergrad in muskingum and no one knows where muskingum is but if you know where i do okay yeah it's the middle of nowhere it's halfway between columbus and pennsylvania yes uh and then i went to leveling courses because my original degree was in radio and television uh so i did leveling mm-hmm. courses at kent state so can't read can't write kent state go flashes then, <laughs> go flashes and then i got my uh grad program down as a ohio university bobcat so. Oh, go Bobcats. Yeah. Athens, Ohio is such a cool spot. But yeah, so no, I was there as a grad student. So I didn't see any of the partying down in Athens. I saw my uh, one bedroom apartment that I lived next door to in a house with the guy that looked like he was from ZZ Top with his beard down to his belly. Uh, <laughs> that who, sounds about right. Who I swear to God, he got me through grad school because it like snowed eight inches or something overnight. 
And like, I get up and I'm like, oh gosh, I'm going to have to like call somebody to pick me up. And he had shoveled the whole driveway. He's like, you got to go to class. And I was like, oh, huh. well, look at you. <laughs> look so at nice. you. Awesome. <laughs> my, uh, my brother is a Bobcat. My brother went to okay, you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a cool place. Amy and Brittany, it's like this part in the southeastern corner of Ohio. Just all the, hippies, all the hippies. <laughs> right. It's all the hippies in the middle of Appalachia, Ohio. Like that's yeah, really cool. weird. <laughs> all right. So you called it the council. How did you guys come up with the cup of council uh, name and then the podcast? I mean, so mm -hmm. Amy, your mom says, okay, you need to get a podcast. You grew, you text her, FaceTime each other and you all go, yeah. So how does that go from an idea into mm -hmm. the name cup of council? What's it, what is it? And yeah, it took us, it took us a little while to come up with the name, I think. And we were wanting it to not be, so we're pretty big on making sure we're not only talking about SLP okay. topics, um, because that's a huge part of our lives, but that's mm -hmm. not everything to all of us. Um, so we wanted it, we didn't want it to be like a speechy kind of a name, you know, um, we wanted it to appeal to people that weren't SLPs. Cause also part of our mission, I think is provide a little bit of basic education to parents who are listening, other professionals who are listening that want to learn about speech and development mm -hmm. and things like that. So we wanted it to be kind of more of a, a name that didn't give away what it was, <laughs> that it was just, you know, isolated <laughs> to just SLPs, I guess. Um, and so then we were like, well, the council part has to be in there somewhere. And then we always say when we get together after we've seen each other for a long time, we all have this, like, this is cheesy, this like feeling of our cup being filled. So Aww. then that got brought into it a little bit. Cause we always say that after we, cause we see each other once or twice a year. Um, and then the symbol for our, um, podcast is the schwa. I was going to say it looked like that, but the schwa with a cup, a cup handle added to it to symbolize the cup part. Um, and the schwa is because we all have matching schwa tattoos. Oh, right here on my wrist. You're I like, Avengers, you uh, that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I sure, shouldn't either. Yeah, I definitely should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have matching schwa tattoos because we're unstressed when we're together. So oh, it all kind of, you know, just so one cute. big bowl of speechy jokes just yeah. speechy, speechy speechiness. mushy speechiness yeah <laughs> no that's awesome though guys that's such a cool like idea um what was your first episode like what was that getting to recording i mean mm -hmm. we had a weird unfair advantage because i had spent years working uh not years but like four years working in columbus and new york radio and television so when we came in i was like oh we're going to do this like a radio show and mm -hmm. that's kind of been our format i get the idea that you guys are like hey we're going to treat it like we're talking to each other and it's not a radio format but what was that first jitters like what was it that going through the the beginning of the show so we had a lot of help okay um i'm gonna give a shout out can i give a yeah, shout out i was gonna say okay. shout out if, if you he if you shout him out one. i need a link or something so oh yeah make... he needs a shout he deserves okay. a shout out because yeah, he, he does this for free um my brother-in-law is actually a podcaster and oh. he he does other things also he has like a regular job but he's starting the side side thing and it's nine five to freedom and he is he has a podcast on entrepreneurship and people starting businesses and um, those kinds of things but he also is starting to coach people to start podcasts. So he got us going. He sent us a little startup guide on all the different equipment we would need and programs that we could check out. He sat through us and walked us through how to use our programming. He helped us edit a few times. It, we wouldn't have been able to do anything without his no. help. At all. Yeah, we literally <laughs> we zoomed. Help. We would zoom and screen share so he could help us figure out how to edit the software. <laughs> yes. yes. And the first time we recorded, we just signed on. And we were like, okay, we need an intro. So we have, we have to say this <laughs> intro and it took us, I think what, 10 times mm -hmm. to record like what yeah. is now <laughs> the intro for all of our episodes, but it's just, we each read well, short we, sentences and, and we mm -hmm. scrapped our first recording completely. Oh, we like, oh, we did. Oh, yeah. because well, we, got, we, we scrapped it because I got <laughs> wasted and I, <laughs> we drank, we drank a little bit too much. Cause we don't ever do that. <laughs> we were like so nervous. Like we can bust through these first three episodes all in one night. Cause they're all just kind of our mini intro episodes, you know, yeah. the first three and we were up real late and 
on a Sunday. Yeah. On a Sunday. <laughs> it took me like weeks to recover from that. And then yeah. scrapped, we scrapped, we threw all it away. It. We yeah. were like, we should just not even do those. And That's so we, idea. we had kind of a practice round and scrapped them all and then d- recorded all of them again. And I think it was really exciting. Our outro mm-hmm. and our intro were the first things that we recorded and edited. And, and Amy and Brittany have learned so much about editing and, and it was the coolest thing to hear it when they finished it. I think we all so were really cool. excited. And so it motivated us to be like, okay, let's do this. Yeah. And so then that's and shout out to my husband who has edited, actually, he pretty much made our intro and outros okay. with the music and all that. And that's, you know, that's a big deal when we didn't yes. even know the software. So to add music to it, I just remember him and I staying up crazy late one night mm-hmm. and we were just pumped and you're right. Yeah. Anytime we get something edited, which is takes us weeks to do, <laughs> it like feels so good, but man, mm-hmm. it, it definitely was not an easy start and still isn't sometimes, but it has mm-hmm. been a team approach from all of our family and friends. <laughs> yeah. And who knew like microphones mattered so much, right? right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like, I really hope I don't sound like I'm in a fishbowl in this episode. Cause last episode we recorded and all, everyone sounds great. And then all of a sudden I, I don't. So today I spent, ha- I spent every nap time of my child, my child today, like trying this out in zoom. So it sounds better, but gosh, just l- so many little things that we mm-hmm. did not anticipate. This was my first microphone, the little blue snowball thing, because it was like, I knew enough about radio and stuff to be dangerous, but not helpful. And it was like, okay, it's like 50 bucks. I'll buy that one. And it was like, just fine enough. And then we got our only advertiser that happened one time only. And so we went out and bought everything that we would ever need eventually. And then I was like, I bought a really good microphone. And that was it. That was the moment. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, your microphone does look fancy and has the yeah, arm and everything. It's all the fancy because it my wife fancy. was like, because I oh, needed yeah. to, to make it look somewhat permanent and, you know, mm-hmm. justify on taxes while you're spending money at the audio store, I guess. I don't know. So <laughs> I've always had this great idea and you talked about getting drunk on your first episode and had to scrap it. Um <laughs> <laughs> One, that's the reason why I edit my own show, because I want to make sure that if I accidentally have anything to drink, I can be like, "Ooh, I don't like that ending of how I said that. Here's my idea. And I have yet to find a podcast that'll do it because I don't think it's appropriate on speech science. So I'm pitching it to the cup of counsel. Oh, boy. I will oh, man. come to your show and do this with y'all. I'm saying yes. Okay. <laughs> Here's my idea. Every, I don't know, 10 minutes. It's one of these, like a shot. And then we do like the mini mentor, the slums test. And then we figure out where cognition goes away in a very scientific way. Oh, yeah. That is well, in the name In the name of science, we would be all. In the name right? of science. Yeah. We would be all for it. Yes. In the name of research. I, I, I want to do it on my show, but or on speech science here. But like everyone else is like, I don't think that fits the format of our show. And I'm like, we don't have a format, but that's okay. But... <laughs> Love that genius idea. <laughs> I like it. Have you guys been it. hit? Have you guys been hit with the crazy, crazy criticisms yet for the podcast? Not yet. I think I we're think so. so new still. Okay. okay. Yeah. We, we hit over a thousand downloads yesterday. Hey. Uh, yeah. Yep. And so, and we're on episode seven. It's only been, we've only been live for exactly a month. Awesome. I feel like that's decent. Mm-hmm. I don't that's know. great. Um, yeah. I, mm-hmm. I was happy if like 50 people would listen to us. So a thousand <laughs> was like, <laughs> yeah. oh, all right. I, I was yeah. happy that we are actually still doing it seven episodes <laughs> yeah i well, think it oh, just became i think i just realized you guys were serious about this like yesterday i was like oh we really are doing a podcast okay okay what, what was it i just saw a stat today that said like 94 percent of the podcasts don't make it past episode six. Oh Ooh, well look at us we guys go. <laughs> we all right we're doing good we've we got are. guests lined up for the next hey, rest of this month and into may go. so i think that's a commitment there you know any like, big yeah. guests um, we just had a big one. Pretty, we big just one. had a really good one. Um, Ashley from Disability Reformed was on oh, our last episode. Reframed, reframed, oh, reframed. Sorry, Disability <laughs> Reframed. Um, and she she gave us a lot of aha moments and mm-hmm. a lot of education, and it was a great. I feel like that was a great episode. Mm-hmm. See, those are the best interviews. Is you know, people will tell us who they want on the show, and I'm sure you guys will get people to be like, "Oh, get this person on air." and follow that lead because that's how we ended up with a couple people that I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this interview. And I walked away with, I need to change how I'm doing therapy or mm-hmm. uh, we've had, we talked to Angie Merced, Merced 
uh, the burnout coach. And I'm oh, like, yeah. I need to like change how much time I'm not spending at work or, you know what I mean? Like spend mm-hmm. less time at work. Um, what has been the biggest, I don't want to say hurdle, but what's been the hardest thing for you guys to come across while doing the podcast? Editing. Editing. I think editing and also just finding common times, you know, oh, there's yeah. three of us and I, and we all have families and Joyner and I both have husbands that work overnight schedules at times mm-hmm. in the medical field. And so that gets tricky mm-hmm. and working around those schedules to try to find a time, all three of us are available. And then to bring another person into it. Um, I think scheduling pieces is, is hard too, mm-hmm. but we're making it work. Cause I think it's a priority for all of us. So that's awesome. Yeah. It's something that I think all three of us want to do. And the, the great thing about, and this is more mushy stuff, but the great thing about, um, something that I really enjoy about this friendship is when you have three of you, you guys are pushing. I feel like in this situation, we are constantly pushing each other to do more or learn more or just keep going, um, in a lot of aspects of our lives. So I think with the three of us, um, it makes us even when we're like, Oh, this is tough. We can't find a common time to do this or the Mm -hmm. the editing. I, I will admit, I don't do any of the editing. The two of them have taken it over. Neither does Michael. It's okay. Okay. okay, That's probably for (laughs) in this situation, we'd have probably about two episodes if I did the editing. So it's, (laughs) it's true. It's, um, I, I think though, if it's a priority, then we're excited about it. And every episode when we think it's like, Oh man, this was really hard. We can't record on Sundays. We can't da da da. And -hmm. then we hear our episode and we're like, Oh, that was really good. Let's keep going. Mm -hmm. So it's like that little, that oomph that we get every time, every time mm -hmm. that music starts, we're like, Oh man, like, this is good. This is good. And (laughs) this last episode that we did, it was exciting because you were asking if we've had any, um, criticisms, but this last one was interesting. Cause we did have, like, I had a friend reach out to me and she was like, I got to talk to you about this Uh-oh. after we did the episode and, or the interview. And she listened to it and she was like, I just need to talk to you about it. And so it was a really lengthy conversation. And the thing I told her was, you know, the fact that you listen to it and you feel all in a tizzy about it is what I love about this podcast. So I was cool. like, I'm excited that we're making conversations happen and making people feel uncomfortable or making people think about things. So mm-hmm. I think that's an exciting thing about it. And and I wasn't implying that anyone would have criticism with your show, but I, I, I become defensive whenever I see anyone criticize a podcast in general, like especially in our small window of podcasting realm, mm-hmm. uh, because there was like an art. I, I don't know about you guys. I can't avoid Facebook arguments. It's like a car crash and I like just <laughs> yes. zoom in and I'm like, I'm going to scroll through all the comments. And someone was like, yes, I'm the same way. So good. And there was like somebody posted their podcast and they're like, we talked about this. And then some other SLP was like, I gave it a listen and 20 minutes in, it was too much fluff. And I'm like, come on, man. Like fast yeah, forward, come on. skip yeah. or don't say anything. We were right. Gotta, we got a review. It was like a two-star review, and it said they talk too much. What? It's like, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> like it's a podcast. It's like, were you yeah, expecting yeah. video? Like I'm yeah. really disappointing you right now. Just they were not silence. pictures. <laughs> <laughs> like, There's yeah, 90 amazing. minutes of quiet, just white noise for you to sleep. <laughs> Oh, yeah, people people can be harsh on behind a computer screen. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I think uh, I think we we are prepared for it, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, we we've talked about that. It could happen. That's the first thing my mom said. She said, Oh, are you doing a podcast? Oh, people are going to be mean in the comments. <laughs> are you okay? And I was like, mom, we haven't even started. I think, um, I think you even text that to us. Like you're like, my yeah. mom thinks people are going to mean to us. And yeah, I was like, right. well, that's probably going to happen at some point. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but so far I feel like we're our harshest, our own harsh critics right now. Yes. So, yeah. but we've, we've only like- gotten positive feedback so far yeah or be like keep it that way tell a story or talk about something and then critique it for like days after like should we really leave that in there or should that Mm. we edit that out do I want people to know that that happened I don't really know yeah that kind of stuff we definitely are worst worst critics Uh, that is the hardest part I think is and that's where my next question was going to go is uh how open are you guys with who you guys are and how vulnerable are you all on air um I, we did a thing down in Asha and it was Mei Ling. I yell at myself and, um, oh, I forget the fourth person. Oh, Rachel Madel from Talking With Tech. And we talked about how important it is or how scary it is to, you know, put yourself out there because 
the moment that you start a podcast, love it or hate it, people are going to look at you and kind of like what you were saying, Joiner, they're going to look at you as like the expert and take what you say and go, this is the truth. And it's like, ah, I'm an idiot. I just am an idiot with a microphone. <laughs> but like how besides Joiner, you kind of going by Joiner, you all go by your real names. Like just the first name, right? Oh, okay. You guys don't use your last names on air. No, we haven't. Have we? We haven't. No, no. Well, Except do I me. need I'm to go and edit that out now? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I don't oh, think okay. so. I mean, I think, yeah, we, I think people, yeah, we'll figure it out, but no, that's fine. We just write, write, write Amy, Brittany, Joiner on most things, right? Or no, we have Amy, Brittany, Katie, I think. On Amy, Brittany, things. Katie. And then our intro says, I'm Joiner, better known as, or I'm Katie, better known as yeah. Joiner. Mm -hmm. We well, didn't, at first we weren't sure to advertise uh, our school. Mm -hmm. we, we definitely don't talk about our children. Mm -hmm. um, and then we weren't sure uh, to advertise our school. We didn't know, you know, not that we have anything negative to say, but we mm -hmm. don't want to put a reputation on anyone, right. anything. So we also keep that kind of to ourselves and where our jobs are exactly. So that that's a big one. Our I think for jobs, us, our specific yeah. mm -hmm. field, location, yeah, location. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sorry but, I'm, I'm... no it's okay <laughs> other than i mean but other than that i mean i don't think we really i mean what what you, what you hear is what you hear and what you get i mean we right. mm -hmm. we pretty much share everything i mean there's some <laughs> yeah, stories we'll think this is really funny and we should tell people and we think people will think it's hilarious mm -hmm. and we will and then we'll be like Mm -hmm. we're professionals mm -hmm. should we have shared that and then we'll go and then we do anyway when we do anyway <laughs> and then we get feedback from people that are like even in the, our field even and they're like mm -hmm. that story's hilarious that was so fun that was so relatable that was I had a friend reach out to me the other day and she said I'm listening to your podcast as I write my therapy notes and I feel like I am getting to sit next to you and have conversation with you again and it makes me miss you so much Aww. so it's like that was one of the best compliments I could ever get. Cause I was like, it really shows that I'm, she said the story that you guys just talked about, it, it totally sounded like something you would do. So she said, even listening to it, she felt like she was sitting with me and talking with me. So I was like, you know what? That's the best compliment I can get that it really, our friendship is so raw and it's so meaningful to us and our jobs are, I mean, a lot of people like to be like, I'm a speech therapist. It's all rainbows and cupcakes. And it's just not <laughs> like there's just days that it's just not. And so I think we like to talk about, I think we like to be really real and be the side of, of that and talk about the rainbow and cupcake days, but mm -hmm. also talk about the hard days. And, um, so I, I think we're actually really real in terms of content and personality mm -hmm. and stories. Um, but our, our intro, we, we say in our intro, Amy's favorite line. It's my favorite. We're experts in basically nothing. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. 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 So and I that's think in our intro yeah. before every episode, we're like, this doesn't take away advice mm -hmm. from a medical professional, mm -hmm. you know, even though we are professionals, this, you know, does not take away from that. We're experts in basically nothing, you know, mm -hmm. we're just interested. We are here to learn too. So we try to preface that. I think mm -hmm. our biggest thing is like, we'll be, we'll be learning alongside with you. Oh, so I like that. That's kind yeah. of always been our goal. Yeah. We did our first three seasons without that little like warning tag. And like, <laughs> we would always get like some random email and it was like, I'm like located in the middle of nowhere, Russia. And <laughs> I need a speech therapist for my English speaking kid. Can you all help? And we're like, no. Wow. I don't, <laughs> sure can. <laughs> I don't even know who to recommend you to, sir. Like, yeah, we're just chatting. We're just chatting with microphones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're just idiots with microphones holding our show together with paper clips and tape. That's all we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> You've so, been holding it together pretty well, though, it seems well, like. We're yeah, you're doing all right. It's mm -hmm. because that, again, like you guys, you guys are three friends. Michelle and I were friends in grad school. Michael and I became friends because of the podcast. And because of the podcast, Michelle and I are able to talk every week. Michael and I are able to talk every week. And, and I'm sure you guys feel the same way. We look forward to talking on air mm -hmm. and we'll come in with like our show. Our format is like the extra of, of speech therapy. So we're like the Mario Lopez extra show. So if it's <laughs> in the news, we want to talk about it. And we'll come in with like five stories to talk about and we'll get through one and we'll go, all right. That's all we needed because we talked 40 minutes about something else that's related to a topic we ran into. Now, yeah. 
as we start to wrap this up, where do you guys see Cup of Council going? Are you guys going to look at 52 episodes a year? Are you guys going to do 20 episodes a season? What is your goal? <laughs> 10,000 listeners, an episode, a thousand. What do, where, where do you guys see it being? Where do you guys Ellen, want it to go? Free vacations, hey, Ellen. Hey, right, <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> Ellen was the first thing that we joked about. We're like, Ellen, if okay. you're listening, if you're listening, <laughs> Ellen, we'd love to be on your show. If no, Ellen's the- listening, I want her to retweet it because I need those listens. <laughs> <laughs> we'd love to no, be on your was- show. Just, just sit there and be like, "Yep, we're a podcast." Okay. That's all. <laughs> That's all we got. That was one of our. That was a joke that we had in the very beginning, though. Like, mm-hmm. either this is gonna be something that we do for a little bit. It's going to flop and we'll laugh about it in 20 years. Like, Hey, remember that time we spent all this money on all this stuff. And then we, (laughs) nobody listened to us. That was fun. Or we're going to be like, what should we, what am I going to wear to Ellen? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There's no in between or (laughs) cup of council podcast episode 780 coming at you from the Maldives. Thank you. (laughs) So do you guys know who Chris Hardwick is? No, 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 I don't think okay. I do. He used to be the host on MTV for Wild and Out or Singled and Out back in the 90s. And he hosts the Talking with Talking Dead show following The Walking Dead on AMC. Oh. And okay. he's got his own little podcast and he's got like a community board. And when we first started, I wrote in and I was like, we're starting a disability podcast, blah, blah, blah. And he like read it on the podcast. And I was like, Oh, this is the greatest thing ever. And for like (laughs) one episode, I am not joking. One episode, it was like 6,000 downloads because everyone was like, Chris Hardwick read about it. And then the next one was like 500 downloads. And we're like, (laughs) oh, those were all the Chris Hardwick people that went, Mm, we don't <laughs> care. <laughs> well, we're pretty excited to be on this podcast. This yeah, is, we uh, are. We this are excited. A, this is a big deal for us. So, oh, we're I don't glad know you where, guys are here. Yeah, thanks for having us. I I don't know, know where exactly we're aiming for. I don't think we've talked too much about that. We kind of just live in the moment and are enjoying our current episodes. I know we have a ton of episode ideas, so I don't foresee the subject, like having a topic issue going away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it, yeah, it just depends on like, I bet when the fall starts, when school starts and as our kids get older, the time thing may be more challenging, but. Do you guys listen to other podcasts? Like not speech therapy podcasts, but what are, what would be your number one or two recommended podcasts that this is how we're going to judge you? Who do you listen to? Oh gosh. That that influences the way you do your show. I can say I probably annoy the crap out of the two of them. I yes. am a huge <laughs> Yes. You I am a... I know what, what you're gonna say. I'm gonna I mute myself. Too. I'm just gonna mute myself right now. <laughs> I model everything off of Brene Brown. I'm a huge Brene Brown fan, and she her podcast is probably one of my absolute favorite podcasts. Um I think that she just has great content and I am also a big, this American life fan. Those are probably my two and invisibilia. That's another NPR one. I think Mm -hmm. those are probably my three go-tos. If I'm going to listen to a podcast would be anything with Brene Brown and invisibilia and this American life. Nice. I don't listen to podcasts. What? I know. I know. I've never gotten into them. I listen to one. I always listen like murder mystery ones. Okay. Or like, uh, yeah, anything mystery. And then I get really scared. I, I used to run a lot mm-hmm. uh, pre-baby and I would listen to them and then freak myself out on my runs. Uh, no, I'm a book Good on idea. tape gal. I have so many, every time I'm in the car, I'm listening to a book, okay. audio books all the time. I just like to read. So, so I guess uh, this podcast and your podcast are my, Hey, that's we'll what I listen to. And I'm kind of all over the place. Like the two that I listen to religiously would be the daily, the New York times, Mm -hmm, just mm kind of quick, like daily update on the news and stuff. Um, I like that one. And then I am an office fan. So I listen to the Uh, office ladies. That's that's a favorite one of mine. And then I kind of like dabble all around in the speech podcast world. So I I don't have one that I listen to, you know, every single episode all the way, Mm -hmm. you know, every single time that it's aired, but I, hop around and depending on what my interest is at that time and to get through paperwork i'll i'll just pick one nice i am uh dak shepherd i don't he's married to 
someone armchair from Frozen. Expert. Yeah, armchair and expert. I do like that one too. I do. I actually listened to that one too. Did you yeah, listen this one. week? Armchair and dangerous. No, I haven't listened. I do really like that one though. Yeah, I like that one too. Are we okay? <laughs> well, that was cool. <laughs> Peter, shut so, up. Fun thing behind the scenes. Uh, my computer decided to go into sleep mode because I hadn't touched the mouse in enough time. Oh my uh, gosh. You got real dark Touch over there all of a sudden. Yeah. Have yeah. you okay, armchair and dangerous this week? It was all about cannibals. Oh, right. Nope, didn't listen to that one yet. <laughs> but yeah, so no, I'm doing the Dak Shepard one and then um Kevin Smith, uh his like Silent Bob, Jay and Silent Bob, Silent Bob. Uh, mm-hmm. does a fat man on Batman and it's just like all nerdy stuff. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. another nerdy comic book one. So, Oh, I have listened to game of Thrones podcast. Ooh, I love game of go. Thrones. Yeah. Okay. So I've listened to some podcasts. Yeah. See, you Speaking of nerdy you things know about it. I love that. <laughs> Brittany, I love that your answer is I don't listen to podcasts. I started one, but I don't listen to any yeah. of them. Except yeah. these four that I do <laughs> listen to. I don't listen to yeah, any yeah, all four of these. <laughs> so okay so where can people find cup of counsel i know you all are on facebook Mm -hmm. we're Mm -hmm. on facebook and instagram um and then our podcast is you know everywhere on apple Podcasts, google spotify iHeartRadio, pandora all of those sites we also have a buzzsprout site that's our hosting platform so cup of counsel at um cup of counsel dot buzzsprout Dot com and we're working on a website so there, there will be a website at some point with you know people can sign up for a mailing list and hopefully we can get some more interaction with listeners that way um yeah and we have merch also hey. so <laughs> we'll be doing some fun giveaways i think join our yep hey. nice. our, our merch was all made by print world texas Ooh. i can give you their instagram handle you want that go for it mm-hmm Oh, okay. You're going to send it to me and I'll put it in the link. Oh yeah. I think, it? I think it's print world oh. TX. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. You were going to say it. You're like, yeah. do you like, want it? And we're like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. <laughs> that was when you're like, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to yeah. give it to you. Yeah. <laughs> not now. Yep. Not, not now. right now though. <laughs> we'll have to wait. <laughs> On that note, Amy, Brittany, Joyner, I'm so glad to welcome you guys into the speech therapy realm of podcasting. Um, or the speech language pathologist world or the speechy realm, whatever y'all go by. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole different can of worms, but it is. Um, yeah. <laughs> dudes, I'm so happy to have more people podcasting about speech and language pathology because, uh, and this is where it gets kind of mushy. So I do apologize on a Kevin Smith podcast years ago, he talked about how important it is that we just create something. And then what we've created can be consumed by our family years oh. later. So my sons may have no idea what I'm talking about right now, but when they're 50 or 60 and I'm not here, I don't want to say that too loud because they're in the other room. <laughs> like they can go, oh my gosh, my dad was not funny at all. Or, oh, he was really funny or whatever. And I'm so glad that you guys get to be part of this awesome world to create stuff. So welcome to Speech Therapy Podcasting. And then also thank you so much for joining Speech Science today. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Speech Science, episode number 142. Mike, you know what's really cool is I look back on the Facebook memories and it's like three years ago, we did episode number 100 or, you know, what was it? Five years ago, it was episode number two was this week. And that's insane. To see that we've come almost 150 episodes later averaging about 30 episodes a season i think that's freaking impressive how how long have you me and michelle been doing this shoot you michelle and i yeah let's use the right grammar here sir uh i think we're on like 90 episodes 80 episodes dude i would say we started in 2016 17 so yeah i think we're coming up on your 100th episodes total I think it so that's like a solid five years. Yeah. Yeah, we do Damn, like 30 dude. episodes a year. So it's not that bad. But I had black hair. I had black hair when we first started. <laughs> yeah, me too. I had <laughs> I started this podcast with one kid. Now I have three. Damn, dude. Yeah, now I have one. Oh man, time flies. We were talking off air or just in the break there about podcasts. And you were talking about how it's so hard to find new pod not necessarily new podcasts, but like 
the niche window, right? It's, it's not hard to find new podcasts because there's about <laughs> a thousand new ones a day, but just finding something good to listen to now, it's like, it's, it's insane how many podcasts there are. Everybody has a podcast now, it's nuts. So I had to learn to do something and I, going back to our executive functioning conversation, I don't know if this is a sign of my executive functioning, but I had to teach myself that it's okay not to listen to every episode of every podcast I'm subscribed to. Like, Correct. it was so hard, dude, the first time that I was like, delete that episode that I didn't listen to. Goodness, I don't know dude. why. Like, but yeah, I, I was just doing the math here. I'm, I'm subscribed to two, four, six, eight, ten. Forty-four podcasts. Damn, dude. Now, some of them are like Zach to the Future, where uh, Mark Paul Glossier discusses Saved <laughs> by the Bell episodes, dude. Um, and uh, some of them are the Mad Chatters or the Jim Brockmeyer podcast. So, just well. Like Oh, hit us up, speechsciencepodcast.com. Hey, so it's the Ashes Spotlight. This is usually where we can look at something good or something bad Asha is doing. Last week, we called them out for their lack of diversity in the elections or lack of elections. But this week, I thought I would give them a shout out. And Mike, happy Better Hearing, Better Hearing and Speech Month. Mm -hmm. And on the ASHA website, asha.org slash BHSM, they have a whole bunch of free things that we can use to help spread awareness in our work environment. I like it. So what, are you doing anything for better hearing and speech month? Um, I'll probably like, you know, pass a few things out or, you know, spread the word on social media a little bit like everyone else does, it seems yeah. like. So I wouldn't say anything too productive, but uh, that's fair. You know, you know, I got my pride. I I handed out 120 uh, packets today with candy into all the teachers' mailboxes, and then mm -hmm. sent out an email using the press releases from the ASHA website today. Okay. Uh, next week, I'm handing out earplugs with some hearing information, and then the week after that, it's water and voice, and then it's a highlighter because I have highlighter flags. Okay. <laughs> Not bad, dude. Hey, dude, I gotta, I gotta prove why I'm a whatever I am at the schools. What are you at the schools? I don't know. Middle school SLP, former ASHA SEAL. Bowling coach. Bowling coach, different school. Dude, though. ASHA SEAL sounds so hardcore. <laughs> I know it does. Like you killed Bin Laden or something. No, just the state education advocacy there. I didn't kill anybody except lowering your school numbers. ASHA SEAL. Does ASHA SEAL stand state. for something? State education advocacy leader. Goodness, dude. Mm -hmm. Means I know the law. Okay. So. Hit us up. Go to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. Mike, let's wrap up this baby. What are you looking forward to this week that is not speech or therapy or communication related? Mm, good question. Um, I would probably say just, uh, uh, just getting ready for graduation. I work with a lot of high school seniors, and a lot of them are going to some great colleges and getting ready to party with them. Nice. Mm-hmm. Um, what am I looking forward to? I am looking forward to it's two weeks away, but it's the prep for my son's eighth birthday party. Oh, what are so, the plans? Uh, he's doing two parties. He's doing a little one with his friends and then he's doing one with the family. So okay. socially distancing. We don't know yet. And then he's also got a boy scout camp out coming up or a cub scout camp out coming up. Okay. So nice. Slowly getting back to normal. Not bad, dude. All right. We want to hear from you. Make sure you head over to our website, speechsciencepodcast.com. Email us, speechsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Phone calls or text message 614-681-1798. Of course, our Discord is always open, discord.speechsciencepodcast.com. And if you want to rock some speech science gear, go to merchandise.speechsciencepodcast.com. 
Our opening music was Please Listen Carefully by Jazar. It's licensed under an attribution and share alike license. Our bump music is the County Fair Rock. Copyrighted John Deku. Find his music at soundcloud.com slash dirtdogmusic. Uh, the Informed SLP had At The Count by Broke For Free. It's licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. And our closing music is The Slow Burn by Kevin McLeod. It's licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license as well. In the immortal words of Janice Wright, be a willow, don't be an oak. The willow will bend and return to form for the missing willow, Michelle Wintering, and current executive functioning guru willow, Ooh. Mike McLeod. I'm Matt Hot. Until next week. So long, everybody. Peace. Dude, that was a long time. I like that. Speech Science is edited and produced by MWH Production. Please follow Speech Science on Twitter at Speech Science PC and like our page on Facebook. For more original podcasts, please visit ExceptionalEd.com and rate and subscribe to our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts.